I'm Eric Marcus, and this is Making Gay History. Nancy Walker had a type. She liked the brainy ones. In 1962, when Nancy was in her late 20s, she met Penny. Penny was smart as a whip, wise beyond her 18 years, and she read James Joyce. Nancy was impressed. The two fell in love and became life partners. By the time Nancy and Penny got involved in the gay rights movement in the early 1970s, they were living in Toronto, Canada, where Penny was attending graduate school. That's where they joined their first gay organization. In the mid-70s, they moved back to the U.S., to Boston, Massachusetts, and Nancy soon volunteered to work at a weekly newspaper called The Gay Community News. As you know from our previous episodes, the post-Stonewall years saw an explosion of new gay rights organizations. And along with the new organizations came scores of new publications. The Gay Community News, or GCN, was among the more prominent, an influential gay liberation paper with a national readership. Nancy was in her 40s when she joined GCN. She was an outspoken New Yorker and a moderate pragmatist. It's no surprise that Nancy and the younger, more radical GCN staff didn't always see eye to eye. So here's the scene. It's the winter of 1989, and I've just traveled to the Jamaica Plain neighborhood of Boston, where Nancy and Penny share a classic Victorian house, complete with a turret and peeling paint. They've been a couple for a long time, and it shows. While Nancy and I talk, Penny's on hand to offer tea, chime in, and help Nancy when her memory fails her. Nancy is sitting in a comfortable upholstered chair. She's dressed in dark slacks and a light-colored blouse, which is where I clip my microphone. I press record. Interview with Nancy Walker, Sunday, December 10th, 1989, at the home of Nancy Walker in Jamaica, Plains, Massachusetts. Interviewer is Eric Marcus, tape one, side one. I had gotten fed up with pretending to be straight. We'd been together nine years and we had no gay friends. So that's when we first went to DOB in New York, and then when we went back to Canada, we were just on a summer vacation in New York. We went back, that must have been 71 or 72, I'm not sure. Took us, even though we thought we were big shots, took us a long time to get the guts to go. Remember, we kept finding excuses not to go. There's always something wrong. Finally, we went and we looked around the room and saw people like our grandmothers. I said, what the hell? Is this what we were afraid of? And that was the beginning. And then when we went to Canada and saw a notice in a little newspaper that talked about a homophile, is what they called a homophile organization, we said, hey, let's call and see what it's about. And we did. That was in 72, I think, when we first got involved in that. Mm-hmm. We belonged to the Community Homophile Association of Toronto, better known as CHAT. And what was the group's reason for being? Oh, it, I think it was uh, an umbrella group for everything, for, for counseling, for social purposes. Um, they even, I suppose, did some legal work. The law had changed. The law was universally changed to a consenting adult law in Canada. So they had legal advantages that we didn't have, but they didn't have the social advantages. Mm -hmm. It was still terribly condemned. People were very conservative there. I remember in Canada trying so hard to get any gay publications to find out what was going on in the world, and there was one little sleazy bookstore that carried gay papers. They had things like that, but you had to be willing to go into what was labeled and known to the public as a filthy bookstore. And when we moved here, there was a little nook, you know, a little convenience store across the street from the apartment we lived in. And I walked in there, and lo and behold, there's gay newspaper, the gay community news. It was a quarter. So I bought this thing, and I said, hey, look, it's out in the open. It's okay. We don't have to do sleazy things to be gay. And didn't know at the time I was going to wind up making the newspaper and not having to pay for it. I think the reason I worked for them was I didn't want to pay a quarter for the newspaper. When did you join the paper? In 1976, in May of 1976. What was GCN like when you got there? What was the operation like, the physical atmosphere, the kinds of people who were there? It was unbelievable. It was up a long, steep flight of stairs into a big open space that was a mess. They had to uh, 
work very hard to get what little materials they could. They had no money, never had any money. And there were some scruffy looking people, very radical people. Any kind of dress you can imagine they wore. A lot of the people I knew there are now gone because of AIDS or suicide. Um, I mean, the boys had long hair, every kind of hair, every kind of everything. It was a real mixed bag. It was not a luxurious place, but it was home. It meant a great deal to all of us. How, how do you mean it was home? Maybe what I'm trying to say, because that's how I really felt, was that you're somebody else in the rest of the world, uh, not fully honest, that you could be yourself at GCN. We didn't get along with each other at all. Even the people who had the same political persuasions didn't get along. But still, we knew we were among our own. You know, it's like a Jewish family. <laughs> you may not get along, but you know, this is your place. And the rest of it out there is the diaspora. It's not your place. So that's how I felt. I don't know how other people felt about you, see, and I just know they loved it terribly. Paper had to go on, no matter what. And it went through hell. It went through fire. They burned the place down once. And we just moved over to a place in Cambridge that let us use their space. And we never missed a week. That paper has been continuously published since it started, except for two weeks during the year where they had vacations. It's quite a remarkable achievement. What was the fire? It was either the end of the 70s or the beginning of the 80s. And it was devastating. Was it arson? Oh, yes. It was arson, all right. I guess they figured they couldn't get us any other way they were going to do that, but they couldn't get us that way either. What was, what was the purpose of GCN? The purpose? Yeah. I think the purpose was to get out a, gay, a national gay newspaper. It was. It's the only gay national weekly that's gone on since something like 1973. 73. We needed contact with each other. You know, there were still gay people who didn't know there was anybody else in the world. It's hard coming from a place like New York to imagine that. But there are people in Kentucky and Louisiana and places like that that didn't know there were any other gay people. I grew up in Queens and I didn't know there were any other gay people. Uh, well, I didn't know there were gay men. I had no idea. I was so delighted the first time I met an openly gay male, I can't tell you. I said, oh, a brother, somebody I can love. You didn't know there were gay men? No, I didn't. something you don't think about. I mean, I didn't. I sort of grew up in my own little head. Yeah. yeah. Back to the, you know, the issue of why GCN existed. GCN existed. See, it started before I got there. Yes. It was only three years old. But did you feel you had a mission at GCN? Was there a, a, a oh missionary zeal? Oh, my God, yes. Oh, oh, if anything was holy, it was GCN. It was, had a tremendous sense of mission, and we loved it and protected it. Uh, but what it meant to me was finally, all my life I said, I've got these great ideas, and I would like somebody to know about them. So finally I got it place where I could write and other people could read it. Nancy, let's uh, go back to the beginning of my interview with you, the beginning of my questions. What year were you born? 1935. Okay. I was born on St. Patrick's Day, and I think it's just terrific because I wound up in a city where, just in the city of Boston, it is a holiday. Uh -huh. So I always get my day off on my, on my birthday. Where were you born? In Flower Fifth Avenue yeah. Hospital in New York. My mother was born there in 31. Yeah, you see? Yeah. I could have been your mother. Yeah, that's right. Oh, uh, yeah. Where would you have been in 1945 on VJ Day? Do you have any recollection of that? Mm. On the day itself? I know I Around was in that Merrick. Time. That's where I lived. Uh -huh. And I was terrified throughout the war because I had a warped perception, and maybe not so warped, of what was going on with Jews, that they were being put in ovens. And all I could think about was being put into an oven. So I was quite a nervous wreck until the war was over. Huh. So you we thought knew. they might come to get you? Oh, I was sure if we lost the war, I was going to get cooked. <laughs> so that's part of the reason I love this country so much, that whenever my, my, my ex-colleagues would knock the country, I'd think, hey, buster. And I am a Jew. There's no way I'm going anywhere. <laughs> and when I met Jewish people in Canada, they said, you know, you are so aggressively Jewish. There's nowhere else in the world but in America that Jews are open about being Jewish and proud of it. She said, here, you keep your mouth shut. I thought, what an awful way to live. There's all these goddamn closets all over the world. 
I have to be closeted about being Jewish? I got enough trouble. I'm sorry. So I was always, all my life, conscious of being Jewish and being thankful that I was here. And being a lesbian also, I'm still thankful I'm here. With uh, all due respect to my, my more progressive friends, this country isn't the enemy. Our system works. It may be the newest country in the civilized world, but it's the greatest one, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So you it's were a great place. I can hear how you could be at significant odds with your comrades at arms at, at, at GCN because they, they were, were a much lot of... younger. They hadn't lived through the war. Uh -huh. They uh, didn't have the really intense feeling that if I hadn't been in this country, I probably wouldn't exist at all. But when I was a kid, I had a terrible time surviving my family. I wasn't what they wanted. My mother was a perfect lady. And she wanted a little, when she got a little girl, she thought, oh, a little me. Well, I wasn't, I wasn't at all like her. She wanted to dress me in pretty little pink dresses and I would climb trees and my underwear would be hanging out of the tree. And I would pick up worms and put them in my pockets. And I was a real tomboy. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't break me. I would defy them. I cannot remember a time when I didn't. And I really felt at odds with the world, and I didn't know why. And I didn't think I was gay, because I certainly liked boys. And then I met, met uh, the fellow I finally married at college, who was a totally different type. He was Gentile, born in Massachusetts. A um, perfect gentleman. He wouldn't say shit if he had a mouthful. I don't know what he wanted with me. I never did understand that. I kept saying, go away. Go find some nice shiksa. What do you want with me? I'm going to ruin your life. He loved me, he thought. I don't know. Did you ruin his life? No. no. He got married again to a woman much older. He really wanted a mother. His uh -huh. mother, it was, you don't want to hear this. It's complicated well, and not gay. When, uh, when, did you, then, when did you realize that you were, in fact, gay? I was already married. I was 20 years old. I had met a girl at a conference in Christians and Jews, National Conference of Christians and Jews. And I met a girl from the Bronx who was going to Hunter College. Her name was Valerie. She was blonde, very dynamic, da, 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 talking all the time. She was the first person I really, really loved and the minute I knew that, I went to Jeff and said, you want a divorce? And he said, no, you'll outgrow it. Well, I never did outgrow it. Um, and then she, she got married a couple of years after that and went to California, and I thought the world had come to an end. And then five years after all that, this one, she shows up. <coughs> and it was like deja vu. And I thought, how can this be happening a second time in my life? I can't lose it again because I'll go nuts. But this one stayed. We fell in love. Oh, God. Did we ever? That was before gay liberation, before we got involved in it. It was 1962. Now, who knew from gay liberation? I just know, boing, when I met her. It wasn't that I didn't like men. I do like men. And there was no sexual problem about men. But the overwhelming emotional involvement was with this young woman who got away and this one who didn't. <laughs> Did you, did you know what that was in 19, this is 1954, you said? Did, oh, I met Valerie in 54. You, I, did people talk about what Oh, no, there was no, no really or? discussion of it. It was just interesting to me to see that they were lesbian couples. Mm -hmm. So I knew they existed, and I knew I was one of them, though I couldn't relate to the things they did. I didn't like bars. I never drank. I couldn't understand this butch femme stuff, and there were some very tough women, you know, switchblade knives and things, and that was not for me. Uh -huh. The woman I liked would be an intellectual who lived in the Bronx and then went to California. And then this one, who didn't go to California. How did you characterize the stuff that you wrote? The column was just sort of like our lives or whatever happened during that week. One of my favorite columns is the one about A people and, and Z people always getting together. I squeeze the toothpaste from the bottom of the tube very carefully. She just goes, whoosh. <laughs> And everything along those lines. It was a funny column. The next one I wrote was about bananas, about the fact that we will buy a certain number of bananas, get down to the last banana, and she won't keep eat it because she wants me to have it. 
And I won't eat it because I want her to have it. So the, the thing gets blacker and blacker and blacker and more disgusting and finally gets thrown out. And I managed to stretch that out for a number of pages. And after that, for quite some time, I would find bananas on my doorknobs. And I mean, people left me bananas all over the place. And they were hysterical. It was a very funny article. It's also true. And I ended it with, mother has just sent us some grapefruit. And we're going to go through the whole thing all over again with the grapefruit. So oh. your, your column was, was? It was mostly us, and uh -huh. sort of like the perils of Pauline. Humorous, about, mostly. But every once in a while, I had a real opinion, and they mm -hmm. didn't like it. One. Gay Pride Day, a fellow named Charlie, Charlie Shively, terribly, terribly radical. He and a number of other fellows have a group. I don't know if they still have it. They write the most outrageous stuff deliberately to upset people. What was the group that Charlie and um, Mike? Fagrag. Fagrag. Oh, God, love you. I can't Never remember anything. Problem. This is very unusual. No, it isn't. I have been losing names and things the past year or so. Uh, Charlie tore up his Harvard degree, burned the Bible, oh, read made yeah. such a stink that I hit the roof this and went a, and wrote a speaking out column. Rally. This was at a gay pride rally? Yes. It was a big deal. And Charlie was wearing his Harvard robe or something and burnt all this stuff. I was livid. I wanted to kill when I got back to the office. And I, I think smoke was coming out of my typewriter. I thought that was the most deathly thing he could have done. I said, here we're trying to achieve something, and this guy goes and does what's the most offensive thing he can think of to do, never mind Harvard, but burning the Bible is not such a smart thing. And then we found out he did not burn or destroy his diploma. It was a photocopy. So there, that's the kind of shit that I can't stand. So I was very angry. I don't remember what I said, but it was quite clear that I was angry. And Neil Miller, who I think was the news editor at the time, Neil said, they're going to call you a Nazi. I said, I don't give a shit what they call me. Just publish it. Call you a Nazi for what? For, for denouncing Charlie, for God's sake. So it was a terrible fight. The whole office was split on this. What was wrong with your position? Why were people fighting? They were very radical. And so I would say at mean? least 90% of the people at any time in GCN were thoroughly radical. Okay. And then some of them were mostly radical. What did, what did radical mean, though? Oh, radical meant burning the Bible. Radical meant um, denouncing the government, hating the country. And I was, those are the kind of people I would say, go, go live in Russia, see how long you last. Theoretically, we shared a common goal. We wanted gay liberation, but what does it mean? Does it mean equal rights? To me, that's all I wanted. They wanted to be able to fuck in the parks. Well, that's wonderful, but I wouldn't take my children there either. And sexual freedom isn't the thing we need now. We need some other things. Sec, that's what I meant. What is, how far is sexual freedom supposed to go? You're allowed to have intercourse on the street corner here because it's what you feel like doing? How does that make you better than a dog? And I don't know that we're better, but different. What happens to civilization when people lose all their socialization and have sex when, where, and with whom they please? Hmm, we have to have a little, little bit of self-control. I'm sorry. I'm not interested in sexual freedom. Uh -huh. I'm interested in human beings being able to live. Uh -huh. Why constantly offend the larger portion, the majority, to whom you have to go with your hat in your hand if you want anything? You don't have to kiss asses, because I think that's undignified. But you have to deal with these people in a way that makes sense. That's how I thought. I also believe that without the radicals to push the spearhead the movement, nothing is going to happen. Because you can write a nice, polite letter to your senator saying, please vote for gay rights. And they can say, throw it in the garbage. And that's as far as it gets. But if you make enough of a stink, they have to pay some kind of attention to you. So I think there's a place for that. But I don't think burning the Bible when every camera in the city is focused on you is a good idea. So I was furious. Not that burning Bibles offends me. No, I'm not at all religious. I just thought that from the point of view of trying to accomplish A, B, and C, burning the Bible was setting us back. You were really a thorn in the side of those who held what they believed to be the only view about what gay rights should be. Maybe. I was unpopular for another thing that I truly believe. Yeah. And then, yeah. That, that? that we should deal with gay issues and not try to spread ourselves all over the world like that Rainbow Coalition stuff. I was not interested in dealing 
when I was dealing as a gay person looking for gay civil rights, I didn't want to get into women. I didn't want to get into blacks. I didn't want to get into South America. I wanted to deal with gay issues. Oh, I was wrong for that, too. So I was wrong. And maybe it is wrong, but that's how I felt. You left GCN in 1984? I think so. Wasn't it? 84? What did you leave over? I was really tired of the hassle at GCN. Everything was a big battle. I had no freedom. I had to constantly fight to put the thing in. They would always tell me they didn't have space. They couldn't run the column when, when they were supposed to. It was supposed to go every other week. And it finally got to be too much. I think I disliked being there because it was uncomfortable. But I don't dislike them. I mm -hmm. think they're wonderful. I think the paper is the single greatest thing that I know. And one of the most wonderful experiences was when we were in Washington. And everybody was marching with their groups. And people saw GCN's banner and all. They came over and told us how wonderful they thought we were. 79. Was it 79? Must have been. Yes, it was October, wasn't it? Yeah. October 79, yes. And, and that felt wonderful. It was quite something, yeah. People who didn't know us except through the paper ran over when they saw the banner. All the way back, driving back along Route 95, we have to stop periodically to go to the bathroom. And you go into a Howard Johnson's and you see all these people with their buttons. We hadn't taken our buttons off, so we saw all these people that were there and had shared this experience. I think this, the single most moving experience that I've had in terms of the gay movement was that march on Washington, where as far as you could see, there was a sea of gay people. It was very peaceful. It was a wonderful feeling. What was so remarkable about seeing all those gay people in one place? It wasn't only that it was in one place, because they had huge marches in New York. It was that it was Washington. It was the capital of our country. And remember how I feel about this country. Being there, being who we were, not being machine gunned, um, it was just a moving experience. We'd finally gotten there, and it, things were going to be different. We're never going to get shoved back in the closets again. It's, we still have a long way to go, but I think we certainly have made progress since the time we first got involved in the early 70s. And we certainly met some gay people. We finally did it. <laughs> In addition to writing her GCN column, Nancy Walker also managed the paper's classified section for several years. Not the most glamorous assignment, but Nancy made it her own. Each week she kicked off the personal ads with a short poem to Mousy Mousy Wildflower from Porcupine, sweet and silly, sometimes wistful notes with inside jokes or more profound ruminations. Mousy, of course, was Penny. The doting, if prickly, porcupine was Nancy. In the spring of 1983, Nancy published several mousy poems that suggested that perhaps all was not right in the mousy porcupine household. Alarmed readers across the country wrote in their concern, forcing Nancy to reassure them that no, mousy had not wandered off into a stranger's bed. That was just a foray into fiction, and queer rodent love was indeed alive and well. After Nancy left GCN in 1984, she wrote for Bay Windows, a more socially oriented gay newspaper. She also continued her work as a secretary for special education in the Boston public school system. Nancy Walker died from complications of breast cancer on May 20th, 1996. She was 61 years old. Penny still lives in the house they once shared. Many thanks to everyone who makes Making Gay History possible. Senior producer Nahani Rouse, producers Josh Gwynn and Janelle Anderson, Deputy Director Inga Dataya, Audio Engineer Jeff Town, Researcher Brian Faree, Photo Editor Michael Green, and our social media team, Christiana Pena, Nick Porter, and Denio Lorenko. Special thanks to Jenna Weiss Berman and our founding editor and producer, Sarah Birmingham. Our theme music was composed by Fritz Myers. Making Gay History is a co-production of Pineapple Street Studios, with assistance from the New York Public Library's Manuscripts and Archives Division and the One Archives at the USC Libraries. Season six of this podcast has been made possible with funding from the Jonathan Logan Family Foundation, the Calamus Foundation, Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS, the Small Change Foundation, Irwin and Andrew Press, and our listeners, 
including Rick Fiore. Thanks, Rick. Stay in touch with Making Gay History by signing up for our newsletter at makinggayhistory.com. Our website is also where you'll find previous episodes, archival photos, full transcripts, and additional information on each of the people and stories we feature. And with the holidays fast approaching, we've got the perfect gift for the Making Gay History fan in your life. From t-shirts and pillows to mugs and tote bags, you'll find a link to our online store at makinggayhistory.com. So long. Until next time.